Hello, so how's everybody doing? Hopefully everybody's doing okay. Not being too bothered by the uh, protests that are going on. Uh, hopefully there's not too many people crowded in the street. Okay. So do we know what week this is? This is week eight. Okay. Week eight, so we're getting close to the end. Do we know what school we're at? Um, University of the West or East, do we know? I think it's East, right? And uh, do you know what class this is? U.S. history through 1970, 1876. Okay, this is what would be the morning class on Mondays from uh, eight o'clock until 12. So uh, that's where we are as far as a heads up. And uh, today we're going to be uh, getting into some good, interesting things today. Okay. And let me make sure I'm on the correct page. Yes, I am. So a little bit of manifest destiny and tensions with Mexico and things like that. Okay. So without further ado, let me go to the uh, PowerPoint. So again, there we go. HIS code 101. U.S. History through 1876, week eight. Okay, let me put my face in the corner there. Does that need to be seen, right? Okay. So we begin with uh, Manifest Destiny. The idea of Manifest Destiny that the United States had the God-given right to expand across the North American continent was a popular and fervently held belief in the 1800s. Fervently means that it was almost hot. It was very, very uh, strong belief, right? So anything similar? Well, for my Korean students, I, I remember when I first started teaching in A-Town, early 2000s, and uh, a lot of, I don't hear them say it too much anymore, but a lot of Koreans very proudly used to tell me the term one blood, Korea is one blood. So it was held very fervently at the time, right? So the same thing here, Americans thought God has given us the right, and we can expand and hopefully go through the end of the continent because you remember the um, original 13 states started on the East Coast and we had to go through Louisiana and buy that from the French. And now we're gonna get into Texas and all the Southern states that we had to uh, buy and negotiate with, with Mexico. because so we wanted to go all the way to the end from New York to California. The idea justified taking Native American territory, that would be the uh, indigenous folks or Indians, and it incited claims to even more land. So, incited means to uh, start either violence or arguing or things like that. So, again, to make it the present, we have uh, protests in the street, and uh, most people are hoping that no bad incident will incite or start a riot, right? Yeah, okay. So, next. Tensions with Mexico. Oh, actually, do I have a question for you here? Yes, I do. Hey, hey. but it's only one because you know that's very small, right? 
So I shall do it because I got to match it up with the book that I have. I don't want you to get more or get less. Whiteboard. Okay, I'm only going to be able to use one hand. I have an injury on my left hand, so might be a little slow in the typing. Okay, so please be patient. Okay, here we have an issue with the capitals again. Wow. Give a nice, easy main topic we just discussed. Boy, this computer really loves these capitals. I gotta constantly watch it. it. Wants to do everything in capitals, but we know when you do that in texting, it means somebody's uh, yelling. I'm not yelling, right? Too tired to be yelling. Okay. All right. Very, very short reading. So only one question. What was Manifest Destiny? So I just explained that. Fresh, fresh, fresh in your mind. I can't give you any hints. So let me give you a couple of minutes there just to answer that. Make sure again, we're, I'm constantly monitoring where we are. Don't want us to lose our spot. Okay. All right, so that should be enough time. It's only one question. So let me get the eraser. Erase this. Okay. Let me go back to the uh, back to the reading. Okay. So we're gonna be at the top of the new page. Uh, tensions with Mexico coincided with America's quest for expansion. Mexico, which had just won its independence from Spain, that's the reason why they speak Spanish, had originally encouraged US settlers in Texas, but its dictator, General Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana, which if you live in Orange County, there's a big city there named Santa Ana, it's named after him, later banned further U.S. immigration. So what it says here, the tensions with Mexico, which means uh, we're not talking about your body being tense. We're talking about uh, friction, problems between the two countries. And then coincide. Coincide means happen at the same time. Right? So that's where we get the word coincidence. And it coincided with America's quest, which is another word for journey for expansion. So like I said, they wanted to go from the New York to California. They wanted to be on the whole continent, coast to coast. Uh, Mexico had won its independence from Spain, okay? Uh, later banned further U.S. immigration. So imagine Mexico owned Texas at the time and later banned uh, American people from migrating to Texas, right? So as I continue, and when Texas declared its own independence from Mexico, so it became independent from Mexico. In 1836, Santa Ana marched to San Antonio with a force of 3,000 men to put down the insurrection. So insurrection is it's a military term. So, uh, you know, if you belong to an army, and then the soldiers get together and say, well, we got to get rid of all the sergeants and the uh, colonels and everybody. That's an insurrection. So uh, this was considered an insurrection against Mexico. He surrounded 200 Texans, including Davy Crockett and Jim Bowie at the Alamo, an old abandoned mission. And if you live in California, you know we have a lot of missions here. So this is the most famous one in Texas. Refusing to surrender, the Texans held firm or strong for 10 days, but the Mexicans captured the Alamo and killed its defenders. So I guess that means they killed everybody there. Okay. All right, 
So remember the Alamo became a rallying cry for the Texans who were steadfast in their quest for independence. So rallying cry means uh, a slogan, what people get around and support, and they say it all the time. So they're always saying, remember the Alamo, uh, Mexicans outnumbered the Texans that were there and killed all of them. So, and then steadfast means very strong. You're really not going to uh, change your mind. Weeks later, while Santa Ana's troops took their afternoon siesta, that is a Spanish word for afternoon rest, uh, that comes about, I've been in the small towns in Mexico in the summer. And a lot of these places do not have air conditioning, modern air conditioning. And it gets so hot that they do this afternoon rest and businesses will close like from one until four. They'll close for three hours because it's so hot. And believe me, when I walked out of the shade into the middle of the street and the sun hit me, uh, I was a very bad feeling. I needed to take a siesta. So uh, while Santana's troops took their afternoon siesta, Texans attacked during the rest time. They were under the command of Sam Houston, who had fought against the Native Americans with Andrew Jackson in the War of 1812. Again, you don't have to remember that date. I try to take it easy on you guys with dates. Uh, by the end of the Battle of San Jacinto, the Texan, Texans captured Santa Ana, who promised in exchange for his life, he'd retreat from Texas. Thus, the Republic of Texas, nicknamed the Lone Star Republic, because of its flag, bore a single star and received its independence. So I, I don't know if I've made this clear enough to you, but uh, Texas being independent from Mexico, I don't know if you realize, Texas was also independent from the United States. It was its own uh, republic. So it didn't even belong to the United States. Okay. Interesting times. Okay. So, as I continue, in the Mexican-American uh, War, this is our, actually, it's not shown up there, uh, but this is actually our first E-fact. In the Mexican-American War's aftermath, Mexican-Americans lived as second-class citizens, remember Mexican-American, in territory they once owned. Many lost their land and livelihoods. And in addition, the war reopened the sticky issue of slavery. Okay. And, uh, now we're at the uh, bottom of the page. Okay. Right. Okay. Sam Houston immediately asked for Texas to be annexed to the United States, which means annex means to become part of them. But as a balance of states stood at the time, there were 13 states opposed to slavery and 13 states in favor of it. Hmm. Northerners felt that admitting Texas where slavery was legal would tip the balance of power in favor of the South. So they would have more votes and more power if they allowed them in. Thus, annexation was tabled, or mean, or mean, which means put on a waiting list, until President John Tyler, and you don't have to remember him, succeeded in pushing a joint resolution through Congress allowing Texas to join the Union in 1845. So a few years later, it just stayed independent. It didn't belong to Mexico. It didn't belong to the United States. Okay, so that means we are. Uh, down at the bottom of the next page, so I have to ask questions here. Okay. Go to the whiteboard. Okay. 
think I have a pencil now. Okay, here we go. So again, I'm doing this one-handed, so be patient. Hmm. Into caps lock and it doesn't want to do it. Interesting. Well, I'll just leave it off. Okay. So what happened at the Alamo? What happened? What did they have a party there? Did they play a football game there? I, I forget they have a new football stadium, the Alamo Dome. I don't know if they Houston, Texas plays there or what have you. So that's the first question. What happened at the Alamo? So you'll have to know what is the Alamo to answer that. Okay. And the next one looks like Ronnie gonna ask you two on that page. I'm being too kind. Okay. This is something again you should know. The next one is a cultural thing. I, I bet there's a lot of young American kids that don't know this answer to this question. But you will. Oops, I guess it doesn't like that. Oh, this thing's giving me a hard time, the caps lock, so I'll just leave it off. Oh, what is the nickname of Texas? So you can impress your uh, American friends and that you know the nickname of Texas. So like I said, some American kids will not know. I'll give you a few minutes to answer those two. I only have two on that page. Let me mark down that I've finished it. Okay, so we're going along at a decent pace today. Yeah, wishing everybody well. Good things. Okay. So here we go. What happened at the Alamo? Again, was it a party? Was it a football game? What happened there? Was it a barbecue? Uh, three, what is the nickname of Texas? Could it be the Dallas Cowboys? Could it be the San Antonio Spurs? Texas? Rangers. So there we go. Okay. So let me erase these. Two is gone. Three is gone. We stop sharing. Go back to the lecture. Okay. So uh, I'll have to turn my page so that we match here. In the Mexican-American War's aftermath, Mexican-Americans lived, oops, I thought I moved this. Okay, let me see where we are, eight different, okay, so the, I'm on the bottom. The Mexican-American War, uh, when the annexation occurred, remember that's when they became part of the United States, Texas. Mexico severed or cut all diplomatic ties to the United States. So they didn't want any dipl diplomatic relations with uh, the US at that time because of what happened. 
Mexicans were even more outraged when U.S. officials insisted that the Rio Grande, which is the giant river out there, goes through a few states, be used as the southern border of Texas. So Mexico didn't like that. Thus, border skirmishes or small fightings, people can't be killed in skirmishes, so don't take them lightly. It's just not a big war. Ensued or took place, even as the new president, James Polk, offered to purchase California and New Mexico and to assume Mexico's debts because they owed money for those two states in exchange for the Rio Grande border. When rumors of Mexican invasion caught the capital's attention, so that means they invaded, they got angry. The president sent General Zachary Taylor and 3,500 troops to the Rio Grande to defend Texas from Mexico. After Mexicans killed several of Taylor's men, Polk asked Congress to declare war, which it promptly or quickly did. The U.S. soldiers who marched across the dry ground became covered with a white dust, <laughs> similar in color and texture to Mexican adobes. You've seen the adobe houses in the Southwest. Soon, Mexicans dubbed or nicknamed their opponents dobies or doughboys, and the name stuck for generations of soldiers, okay? Uh, it didn't take long to capture California, and Americans also forced a Mexican surrender at Monterey, so that's in the northern part of the state of California. Yet the war effort met with criticism for some saw this as an aggressive, unprovoked, which means Nobody pushed you or attacked you to start the war. On disputed territory, undeterred, which means unbothered, President Polk ordered troops south to capture Mexico City. Shortly thereafter, both sides reached peace. And now we're going to come to an uh, obvious uh, fun fact here. Okay. Protesters against the Mexican war claimed it was immoral. So no morals and pro-slavery and against Republican values. Uh, Henry David Thoreau refused to pay his state, Massachusetts, taxes in protest and was placed in jail. See, even back then, you don't pay your taxes, you go to jail even though we have famous movie stars who are told, oh, you don't have to pay your taxes. They always go to jail, no matter how famous they are. So I think the IRS is stronger than the actual American government or the president. Inspired by his arrest, Thoreau wrote Civil Disobedience, which was studied by many, including Mahatma Gandhi. Does everybody know what country he's from? He's not from Mexico. I think he's from India and Martin Luther King. Now that's a local boy there. That's an American guy, Martin Luther King. We have a holiday honoring him, okay? After two years of fighting, two years, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo resulted in Mexico's ceding or giving California and large stretches of the Southwest in the United States, so through the Arizona area, as well as its acceptance of the Rio Grande border. In return, the United States paid the Mexican government $15 million. I wish someone would pay me $15 million. And assumed unpaid claims by US citizens against Mexico. So they're gonna pay those too. Zachary Taylor emerged as a hero and was elected president in 1848. Okay, so that means we're at the bottom 
of what would be uh, 84 in my book. So I got to ask questions again. Okay. Each time we get to the bottom, questions come. Okay, I'm off to the whiteboard. Get the old pencil there. Okay, so here we go. Again, I'm doing this with one hand. I have an injury on the left hand, so it's a little too painful to do too much. See if I can do this with my bad hand. Yay. Okay. So, uh, question four What started the Mexican American War? What started it? Again, was it a football game? Were they fighting over a beautiful woman? What, what started this war? Okay. And it looks like I'm only going to ask you two on this page. So again, being a little kind. So this one is connected to the first one. We know that. Oh, there's those capitals again. When I want it, they're not there. When I don't want it, they show up. What ended this war? So again, once you know the answer to four, then you should know the answer to five. So I'll give you a few minutes there. No, it's not so juice water. Okay, so let me get the eraser out. Okay. Again, four is what started the Mexican-American War and what ended it. It's always a start and it's always a beginning and there's always an end. Okay, so let me go back to the lecture. Okay, so we ended with the 1848, so now we're Go West will be at the top of my next page. So go West, young man. <sighs> After the Louisiana purchase, again, we bought that from France. That's why it's Louisiana. You can see that's not a traditional English written word. The Louisiana purchase uh, spurred or started westward expansion in the early 1800s, so prior. The country experienced the continued growth of its boundaries, again, east to west. Many had the idea that the vast grasslands west of the Mississippi were unsuitable for farming, which means they were, it was not good soil for farming. A theory that was promoted by explorers such as Lieutenant Zebulon Pike, an army officer who led a group from St. Louis or San Luis into Minnesota. Uh, Pike won command of a Southwest expedition that took him far into Spanish held lands between 1806 and 1807. 
in what is now known as Colorado, the lieutenant discovered a mountain 14,110 feet, or for, since we don't use that here in the United States for all my other students, 4,301 meters. So maybe I'll have Mr. Hong measure that right now. Hi. Now bearing the name Pikes Peak. So you can see that a lot of people drive to Colorado and they look for Pikes Peak. I think I saw it as a kid when my father drove through there. Uh, Pike described much of the territory he discovered as a wasteland, which means nothing will grow there. It's not a good place to start a community. It's just a wasteland. And subsequent explorers, which mean the following explorers, concurred or agreed with the notion, the idea, that the Great Plains region was bleak. If something is bleak, it doesn't have much of anything there. And again, if a region doesn't have water or trees or what have you, it's not a good place to start a town. Early settlers understandably avoided the plains. So early settlers said that's not a place for us to settle and make a community. In 1818 and 1842, treaties settled Canadian border disputes with Britain from Northern Maine to the Continental Divide. So we had some issues there. So Canada is our border and then Britain was involved in there. So we had to settle some disputes with these folks. England and America's disputed control of the Oregon County was settled in 1846, with the United States gaining sovereignty. I explained this before, it means control. Every country has their own sovereignty. So Oregon now fell under American sovereignty. Of the region south of the 49th parallel, we don't have to uh, remember that just like uh, the DMZ in Korea dividing south and north. I forget what's the number there, the parallel. So if I don't have to remember that, you guys don't have to remember this. I'll be kind. Now the country spanned two oceans, meaning New York touched the Atlantic Ocean and Oregon uh, now touched the Pacific Ocean. So, a lot of expansion there. Around this time, members of a religious sect or group founded by Joseph Smith in 1830 sought isolation, which means to be left alone, to be in an area where only they were so they could practice their religion. They didn't want to be bothered by other outside peoples because you'll find out that's what had happened to them prior. So again, uh, founded by Joseph Smith in 1830, sought isolation in the West as they had hounded, been hounded in Hawaii. So that has nothing to do with a hound dog, but hounded means to be constantly bothered, constantly. That's why you might hear the term in English that the man says, oh, my wife hounds me 24 hours a day. Right? So that means she bothers him 24 hours a day. So they were bothered because they were a new religious sect in Ohio, Missouri, then Illinois, and Iowa. This group was known as the Mormons. Mormons are members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, practiced polygamy, and roused growing suspicion. So polygamy means you can have more than one. Wife, I think their limit is four. I'm not sure. I, Muslims are four. Uh, so the strict Christians, who were the majority in the states, you only could have one wife. So they were suspicious of people that had more than one wife. So roused growing suspicion. It means suspicion grew, right? 
and it, it was started by those kinds of uh, things. Uh, in 1847, a group of Mormons ventured over the prairie, prairie is an open area, through the Rocky Mountains until they reached the dreary flats beside the Great Salt Lake in Utah. So this is quite the opposite of what we were reading prior and going to Colorado and things like that, where those areas were bleak didn't have a lot to offer, so regular settlers did not want to live there. But these Mormons wanted to be left alone. So when the dreary means kind of depressing, flats is a flat area, so again, no general trees around, beside the Great Salt Lake, so a lake full of salt. So this excited them. They could have their privacy here, and probably people would not want to move there. Over the next several years, thousands followed the Mormon trail. Uh, their leader, which we just mentioned his name, had blazed. They called this homeland Zion. And like the Israelites of old, they made their desert bloom. So they brought uh, literally and figuratively fl real flowers and then actually by them making it a, a successful city, it also means that it bloomed uh, like flowers. By 1860, approximately 12,000 Mormons lived in the Salt Lake City environs or area. Okay. Now we're at the bottom of the page. On uh, January 24th, 1848, just days before Mexico signed the treaty giving California to the United States, men working at a sawmill in Sacramento Valley struck gold along the American River. Mill owner John Sutter implored his workers to keep the discovery quiet. Shh, and you'll find out why. But of course, news spread particularly from the lips of those who stood to drop it. So whatever they discovered, the ones that had the chance to profit, they were the ones who told the secret. That was not good. Samuel Brennan was one, and then that ends the page. So let me... Uh, Ask the questions here. Go to the whiteboard. Get the pencil. Okay. So this shall be question six. Which religious group sought isolation in the West? Was it the Jehovah's Witness? Was it the Catholic Church? Was it Moon Sang Myan? Who sought isolation in the West at this time? I have another one. Easy stuff if you follow, but they took my pencil away. Okay, let me go get the pencil back, those stealers. Okay. Oh, those capitals, I just don't want to go away.
So again, I'm only going to give you two on this page. Uh, what was discovered in Sacramento, the capital of California, on January 24th, 1848? What was discovered there? Was it kimchi? Was it ketchup? Was it tequila? What was discovered there? Okay, so let me give you a minute or two to get that. Let me mark the pages I've done. That would be uh, 84. Okay. Let's finish those. Do, do, do. They said it was going to rain today, but I don't think it's going to rain. So again, the typical uh, American weather forecasters are wrong, especially in California. We never know when it's going to be hot or cold. Okay, so let me go for the eraser here. Here it is. So which religious group sought isolation in the West? Again, Jehovah's Witness, Catholics, Sun Myung Moon. Who was it? Okay, seven. What was discovered in Sacramento on January 24th, 1848? Was it the donut? And the reason why I say that is because of Friday, was National Donut Day. I think in the US, I think Wednesday was National Hamburger Day. I ate a hamburger that day, but I did not eat a donut on Friday. So I feel really bad, like I'm not a true American. So I'm gonna try to eat some donuts this weekend. Okay. So let's go back to the PowerPoint. So we just ended with the 18. 48, right? Or is my 18th one? Let's see. Right. All right. You see here, I'm trying to, because we had a, oh. That was, I'm just checking, that was 80, oh, that was 85. So we actually, let me see here. Let me just check, yeah, yeah, yeah. Did I lose my spot? I, Right. Okay, so I'll read through the gold is discovered. Oh, we read that. Okay, so yeah, we have to skip over to by spring. Yeah, actually a little before. Okay, yeah, by spring, uh, chaos erupted as men quit their jobs, leaving ghost towns in their wake. So there's a lot of strange words there. Okay, and let me get into those for you. I must help you, it's my job. If I haven't discussed chaos before, that's when there is no control going on, let's say, in a city. People are fighting, uh, stealing, killing, burning, that's uh, chaos. So erupted, that's a term, a word we usually word, use for volcano, boom. We don't say a volcano exploded because that means that there wouldn't be the mountain there, but from inside it actually erupted and came out the top. So chaos erupted as men quit their jobs, leaving ghost towns in their wake. So what that means is 
uh, in different areas in the Southwest and California, there was these small towns, very small towns. And once men heard that they could possibly get rich by panning or mining for gold, they left the town to go to Sacramento and other areas where gold was discovered. So when they did this, these towns became ghost towns. Nobody lived there anymore. That's why it says in their wake. Wake means what comes after them when they leave, like we could say. In the wake of an earthquake, what happened? The buildings fell down. Okay. Hundreds of soldiers abandoned their posts. So even soldiers said, forget the army and the low pay and the bad food. I want to strike it rich. And in San Francisco Harbor, sailors literally left their ships to rot. So they left the ship and they said, we don't care what the hell happens to the ship. Someone can steal it, someone can burn it, or it can just rot or fall apart. As everyone flocked, so flocked is a term we use for birds. When you see hundreds of birds that just stay in one area, they have all flocked together. So here, uh, human men flocked to the frenzy or craziness of finding gold. A gold fever, right? It's a gold fever. All right, and here's a fun fact. Uh, no, the gold standard, because they have a question, is US money backed by gold today? It was, and that's when the United States did not have any debt. But now, every time we get a new president, it's more and more trillion dollars of debt and I, you know a trillion okay one million and then millions and then billions and i don't know how many hundreds of billions make a trillion i don't know off the top of my head so then but that's one trillion so it's like okay now it's 12 to what so there you go the gold standard lasted until 1971 anybody here born in 71 no i wasn't born yet either <laughs> When President Nixon announced that the United States would no longer exchange dollars for gold, that was a bad move. Now the United States is on a system of fiat money, which is used only as a medium of exchange. So the old backup system, which now you hear people on the radio telling you, you should back up everything with gold. The US government decided not to do it. We used to talk about this place called Fort Knox uh, in Tennessee. He even made a James Bond movie there where he was inside Fort Knox and was supposed to have the whole gold reserve of the United States. So since we have no longer done that since 71, I don't even know if Fort Knox exists anymore. Maybe it's a museum. I don't know. Okay, now we go down to the gold rush because of the gold fever. It took about six months for the news of the gold discovery to make it back east, so all the way to the eastern states and cities like Philadelphia, Boston, New York. But when it did, President Polk included word in his message to Congress. So talking to the government, he talked about this too, which is not technically a political thing. Thousands rushed over to the Great Plains or by using the Oregon or Mormon trails, remember, through to Salt Lake City, Utah. I might ask you a question like, where did the Mormons settle? And if you tell me something like, oh, I think they settled in Hollywood, uh, you're not going to get any points. Some took the Santa Fe, Sonora, or other southern trails. Those were uh, made by the Spanish prior. And still others went by boat to Panama. Look at that. And across to the city of Panama in order to catch another boat headed for San Francisco. That's a long trip. Although it was a much longer voyage, some made their passage by sailing around Cape Horn. Jesus Christ, that's a dangerous spot. The southernmost point of, is it going to say South Korea? Let me see. Oh, South America. So all the way to the bottom. South America and come back around up through past Mexico and then enter into California. The demand was that great. Okay. This means the fever 
was that strong, okay? Let me make sure, okay, so although it began in the spring of 1848, and they called it the gold rush, grew slowly at first, it wasn't until 1849 that the largest numbers, tens of thousands, so I don't know how close that was to 100,000, maybe it was 70,000 of people flooded across the continent, again, starting from the east and some from the middle, and from all around the globe to converge or meet on the area that would become California. Thus, those in hot pursuit of the precious metal became known as 49ers. So those people that uh, wanted to discover gold in any such way were called 49ers, and that's how the San Francisco football team got its name after these people. They called them the 49ers. Of those who trekked west, so trek is a voyage. That's why you have the show Star Trek, meaning a voyage in space. Few struck it rich, so very few were successful to get a lot of money. But many stayed on to establish themselves in farming or business, increasing California's population nearly tenfold between 1848 and 1853. In 1850, California was admitted as a state. So a few years later, gold rushes took place in the present day states of, so not only California eventually, but this gold fever and rush came to the states of Colorado, Nevada, Montana, Arizona, New Mexico, Idaho, Oregon, and Alaska, and maybe uh, Shanghai and Busan. Believe me? No, of course not. And you shouldn't, don't believe me, right? So that will be the end of my page over here. So I have to give you some questions here. Well, that reading deserves questions. Let me get the pencil. Pencil so you'll be so. Okay. What do you think? I want to ask you two or three. I've been doing only two. I've been very kind. So I'll stay with that procedure. Right. We're getting close to the end of the quarter. Okay, let me make sure I okay, write this is down. So Okay, wait a minute, did I? Okay, so eight is gonna be connected to seven. So once you answer seven, then you can do eight, it's connected, okay? See, I wanted the capital there and it didn't wanna do it. Uh, and now it wants to not go away. Okay, so I'll, I'll be kind, I'll go back to seven for you. So remember, seven asked, what was discovered in Sacramento on January 24th, 1848? So once you have the answer there, you can move on to this page in eight. This caused a situation called what? Okay, that'll make it clearer for you. Next question. Oops, took my pencil away. Bad, oh, these stealers, there's always stealers are on here. Okay.
Not too bad for one hand. I could go slow like an old grandfather if you like. <laughs> I gotta go to the restroom for two hours. I'll be right back. Okay, so the second question on this page. Name some other states where this also took place. Remember, it was not only California uh, eventually. And as usual, like with my questions, it's a pretty good list. So the more that you give me, the more points I can give you. So in other words, if you just put uh, California in one more state, you won't get as many points as someone who puts three or four. It's a pretty good list. So I'll give you a couple minutes to answer those. Make sure I mark this off as done. Okay, hopefully everybody's enjoying themselves and learning things. Right. We're staying calm, cool, and collected. Another drink of my soju, I mean water, excuse me. Eh. Don't wanna steal young peels, soju. Okay, so that should be enough time on those two. So grabbing the old eraser here. All right, uh, connected to seven uh, in Sacramento in 1848. This caused a situation called what? Don't say, oh, it caused the protests of uh, 20, what? no. Nine, name some other states where this also took place. So again, uh, Waijian, I don't want you putting, uh, oh, it's a Beijing and the Shanghai and Dalian and uh, Guangzhou. No, I'm talking America here, okay? All right. By the way, how many states does well, yeah, but I don't know. Korea has nine. I think China has 30 something. Okay. How about the United States? Five, zero. Okay, those are done. So let me go back to the delicious uh, lecture, right? So making sure we start in the same place. Uh, we ended with the, these uh, states here. Yes. So we got to go up to the top to which would be 87 for me. Okay. All right. So wherever a gold strike was made, miners, the people who worked in the gold mines, you can also work in diamond mines like South Africa. Um, I don't know, Korea, someone told me they have silver mines in Korea. I don't know where they pull silver out of a mountain, but there's also silver mines. Uh, they also told me there's a kimchi mine, but I, I don't know if I believe that or not. Uh, miners gathered or got together to build a camp or community that usually had a saloon, that's the Old West name for bar, and gambling house, oh dear, why did they have to gamble? Obviously not. Christian church going folks, right? and very few women or children. Well, because these were single men trying to get rich and most didn't have a wife. And if you didn't have a wife, you couldn't have kids. So interesting. The thing more important was to get rich, not to have a wife. Miners lived in shanties, hastily built wooden frame structures. That's a little too confusing and high level English there. A shanty is something like a shack, so hastily built. So you just put some pieces of wood together and nailed them together and had a hole for a window and made a door and that's where they lived because they just needed a roof over their head to sleep in case it rained. And their whole concentration was built on trying to get rich and find the gold. I mean, a lot of them found little nuggets and what have you, but that's not getting you rich, right? They probably just blew it off in the saloon later. 
So as it says, these little shanties that they could easily abandon when the gold ran out and everyone pulled up stakes to head for the next strike. So this is interesting to get into. What, it ha what happened is, let's say there's a small mountain or an area where they discovered gold. Now, so many guys there mining and going crazy that a lot of times, if it was a small area, they would actually take out all the gold that was there. And at that point, there was no reason to continue to live there. So they could easily abandon these pieces of wood shanties when the gold ran out and then pull up stakes means the stakes they used to look for gold in any of their clothes and head for the next strike. So when someone said, oh, there was a strike of gold in K-Town, they would head over to K-Town. And then when the gold ran out in K-Town, they would pull up stakes and go someplace else. Uh, frontier justice reigned. Ooh, that's going to be good to explain. And each camp set forth its own rules on the size of the gold claim that an individual could possess and the way it should be registered. Sheriffs administered the code. And justice was harsh and swift when necessary. So let me go over some of those things. Um, frontier justice reign. They talk about things like frontier justice. They don't have a real court system or a city set up because they're on the frontier, no jails. So whoever was in charge, and it says here sheriffs were, they kind of made the rules as they saw fit. So that might not be too good for a lot of people. Uh, each camp set forth its own rules on the side of the gold claim. So I guess they said, hey, there's only such a size you can do, right, and collect money for. And then you had to register it, and then they would decide the way you would do it. So these sheriffs, which I don't know who put them in charge, but I guess everybody agreed, and every camp was different. Justice was harsh. A harsh justice is a real tough justice, not a slap on the wrist. Um, I can remember when I was in Malaysia many years ago, and uh, as I was on a tour bus going through the jungles of Malaysia, the tour guide said, and I saw these signs, even if you just possessed marijuana or any kind of drugs, I think they gave you a 99 year jail sentence. That's pretty harsh. And then swift, swift means very fast. So if they decided you did something wrong, who knows what the penalty was, but it came quickly. Again, no sitting in the jail for three months and getting a judge and jury of your peers. No, had to be done quickly because the town could possibly be abandoned very soon when the gold ran out. Although most of the miners were Caucasian men who drew no social distinctions, they did try to keep gold out of Mexican, Chinese, and Native American hands. I guess they were jealous and wanted the gold only for them. No sharing. By 1851, industrial mining became the trend where organized businesses with more advanced technology replaced individual efforts. And by the 1850s, the California gold rush was over. So it did not last a long time, just a few years. Four decades later, others, in spite of the biting wind, so that's when the wind is so strong, it feels like it's biting you. So maybe my friends who are from Jejudo, Jejudo is famous in Korea for being a city of wind, strong winds, and probably stronger women. I'm scared to find out. And frigid cold, which means so cold that it feels like you're almost standing frozen. Treks to Alaska when rich strikes were made near Nome and Fairbanks. Those are cities in Alaska. So, hey, didn't matter. You might freeze and you couldn't handle the wind. Four decades later, you wanted that gold, but you were not scared of Alaska. 
next is the wave of immigrants. It's interesting that most immigrants to the United States did not sail to America for political or religious reasons, as the early settlers may have done. Most immigrants in the 1800s came because of economic deprivation, or deprivation means you're not being given enough. And economics, are not, they're not making enough money at home in their home countries, and African-Americans came involuntarily from Africa as forced laborers to Southern plantation owners, excuse me, AKA slaves. So let me continue. New immigrants typically worked in menial, labor intensive, uh, menial means like hand low low level jobs with a lot of you know hand work and getting dirty labor intensive see very strongly with labor low paying and dangerous jobs that the average american would shun or shun means to not accept or to ignore so you might hear an older person say uh, don't shun me which means don't ignore me uh, because they were social outcasts until they assimilated into American society, immigrants usually stuck to themselves, which means they stayed together with their own groups, maintaining their own cultural traditions and religions. Here's an old term that was popular when I was growing up, the melting pot. The melting pot is forged. The influx, which means a, a large group of people coming at one time, the influx of so many immigrants, especially once they began intermarrying with American ladies, brought the phrase melting pot, meaning that many immigrants' traditions and bloodlines were blended together, creating a new society. Uh, alarmed, which kind of means shocked, Americans began to limit the number of immigrants as early as 1790, when Congress passed an act requiring a two-year residency, and that's the bottom of my page, which would be 87, so you know what that means, it's question time. Back to the whiteboard, get my pencil, Looks like I'm going to stay with only two questions. Wow. But they might be long ones. Okay. So 10. Easy as pie, though. Okay, why did most immigrants come to the US at this time? Was it for free food? Was it for free alcohol? Was it for WIC? Was it they could buy property? What was the reason? And I'm gonna stay with just the two questions per page. See, there goes with those capitals. Man, maybe the capitals is what's stealing my pencil.
Okay, what does the term melting pot mean? Are we talking about fondue here? Uh, is this related to the Chinese hot pot? What does the term melting pot mean? So I'll give you a minute to answer those two. And let me update my position here. So that would have been 87. So we only got two pages to go and we'll be done for the day. We gate. So again, everybody's happy here. That's good. If you miss coming to school or class, hopefully next quarter we can meet again in the classroom. That'll be a lot of fun. Everybody has to, uh, well, my Chinese students have to buy me bolvas. And then my Korean students have to, uh, you know, chum chadam maybe. Um, my Mongolian students, maybe some barbecue, something. Okay, so here we go. 10, why did most immigrants come to the U.S. at this time? So I have to get the eraser in action here. By 11, what does the term melting pot mean? Is it related to the Chinese hot pot? Shall find out. Okay, back to the... PowerPoint. Okay, so let me see as we, uh, two year residency. Yeah, there it is. Okay. All right, uh, winding down folks. Uh, 1790, when Congress passed an act requiring a two year residency, residency period before one could qualify for US citizenship. I think right now, because I tell you I might retire to Korea, I think I have to have five years living there consecutively before I apply. So same kind of things here, this was only two. In 1795, that residency period rose to five years. See, this one went up to five years. And in 1798, during John Adams' administration, Congress passed the Alien and Sedition Acts. This has nothing to do with flying saucers. Uh, people that are not from your country are called aliens, they're foreigners. One of these new laws, the Naturalization Act, increased, increased the waiting period to 14 years, oh my God. While the Alien Act allowed foreigners to be expelled or kicked out if they were thought to threaten American interests. So maybe if the government thought they might be spies. These acts were either repealed, so changed, or expired in the early 1800s, but their passage was historic. So that just means that they actually happened at all, right? Uh, no doubt the greatest wave of immigrants to U.S. soil occurred between 1840 and the 1920s. During this period, approximately 37 million immigrants arrived, mostly of German, Irish, Italian, English, Scottish, Austro-Hungarian, Scandinavian, Russian, Baltic, and Jewish descent. So you can see mostly Western Europeans and Eastern Europeans now. What do we get now? Chinese, Korean, Mongolian, Japanese. So we're getting a lot of people from the Asian countries now. Uh, many of these immigrants arrived in New York Harbor and passed the following inscription or writing on the Statue of Liberty. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. The wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these, the homeless, tempest tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. And that's what the lady of the Statue of Liberty says. Now we're going into the part that says driving forces. The Industrial Revolution, which began in England in the late 18th century. Uh, and spread across Europe, changed the economic and social realities for many peoples. 
as did the potato famine that ravaged or just destroyed Ireland in the 1840s. That's all they had to eat was potatoes and they started running out of those. Immigrants facing poverty at home believed American streets were paved with gold. Coming across in the ship's steerage, many were swiftly disillusioned. So that means the many came across in the bottom of the ship in the storage department where you could really feel all the waves of the ocean and they became disillusioned or uh, worse than worried, probably turned off, like let's stay in our own country. About 70% of all European immigrants initially landed in New York City. That was the start off point. If they came after 1892, most went through their processing and questioning at Ellis Island, which was opened after immigrants inundated, which means just too many of them came in to Castle Garden on Manhattan Island, so they could not handle all of them. Some groups preferred to stay in New York City, while others made homes in Boston, Philadelphia, Baltimore, and New Orleans. And that brings us to the bottom of that page. And guess what? I'm so kind. I only have one question for you there. Whiteboard. Pencil. Okay. Looks like it's going to be a long one, though. But long question for me, short answer for you, I think. Oops. What happened there? It jumped. That's not good. Let me get this out of here. Okay, let me get on the right side of this number. Okay. Okay, about how many immigrants came to the U.S. between the 1840s through the 1920s? Um, so t this is a number answer. So Temujin loves number questions. He loves just to write the numbers, right? If the question was, Temujin, how many wives do you have? He'd probably put 22. So he loves putting those numbers down. So I'll give you a minute to answer that. That's the only question I have for this page means we're going to go to the last page all the quicker. So that would have been 88 in my book. So go back here, get the eraser. So again, about how many immigrants came to the US between 1840 and 1920s? That's an 80 year period. So if you wanna say, oh, I think maybe 20, 10 or 20, I don't think that's correct. Okay, hold the number up a bit. Okay, 12 is gone. Gone. Back to our very last reading here. Okay. So we uh, ended uh, with those cities, Baltimore and New Orleans. So here we go, our last reading. Chinese immigrants during the 1850s entered through San Francisco and stayed in the region. And for my Chinese students, I know most of you are from the mainland. So if you didn't know at this time, uh, 
I don't want to say 100%, but probably 90 something percent were all from Guangzhou. But at the time it was called Canton. So these were Cantonese folks, not mainlanders. So they did not speak mainland Chinese or Mandarin. But with railroads contributing to a transient society, which means people came and went, many immigrants uh, settled wherever they could find work. So where you found work, that's where you stayed. No reason staying in one town if there's no jobs. Those seeking heavy industry or industry jobs, factory jobs, often moved inland to Buffalo, Pittsburgh, Cleveland, Detroit, Chicago, and Minneapolis. So some Chinese folks went all the way into the East Coast. It was a long trip, no freeways, no cars. Uh, German immigrants settled extensively in Texas, the Midwest, New York, and Pennsylvania, or Pennsylvania where plenty of work was available in skilled labor or agriculture, which means farming. While Italian Americans worked in light manufacturing, retail business, or the construction industry, Jewish Americans prefer to settle in major cities such as New York, Chicago, or Boston. That's why we have so many great Jewish delis in those big cities. Members of Slavic groups, Polish or Slovak, to be Czechoslovakia, if you remember that country, found work in heavy manufacturing towns. Okay, now we're going to go to the very last part. Yay! Chinese Americans worked mostly on building the railroads in the light manufacturing or in domestic retail or mining trades. In 1882, Congress passed the Chinese Exclusion Act, which prevented Chinese immigration for years. This stemmed from economic hardship during the Arthur administration where Chinese and Irish immigrants vied or competed for the few available jobs and the tensions between the two led to street fighting in San Francisco. Wow, Irish and Chinese. Uh, women immigrants worked in laundries, retail shops, or light manufacturing. Some, such as Irish American women, were employed as domestic servants or nannies. Uh, it often took two or three generations for immigrants to move up the socioeconomic ladder, which means move up to a better paying job than the tough initial low paying jobs to immigrants and earn wages that could provide the comfortable standard of living that other Americans enjoyed. Yay, we have finished a delicious lecture for this week. So let me go to the questions, and when we do that, we shall be done. Whiteboard for the last time today. Pencil, where are you? What do you saw, pencil? Okay. Oh, I think I have two questions. Bad teacher. Okay. Okay, in 1850, most Chinese immigrants arrived where? Uh, did they arrive, or we read earlier, the majorities were was arriving in uh, New York, Manhattan, or did they arrive in another city? Where is it? Oh, I forgot a letter here. Don't, don't be angry with me, Waisan. Let me put the E there. I put Chinese, which is French. I have to put the English Chinese, okay? Uh, so the last question for today, everybody scream. Everybody give me $20. I lost, say someone stole my pencil again. What is going on? I'm trying to finish this for you guys. Okay. And a question for the ladies. 
don't want them to feel left out. Oops, wrong symbol. There we go, question mark. Last question for the day of the eighth week. Where did most of the women immigrants work? So again, uh, Young Pew, uh, Ken, if you're in my class again, Ken, uh, don't give me these funny answers like, oh, they worked at McDonald's or they worked at Macy's in the makeup counter, okay? In 1850, there were no McDonald's and no Macy's. So where did most of the women immigrants work? So I'll give you a few minutes there. You finish those and you are done for the eighth week. We are hanging in there, which is great. So I guess you've done those. Let me get the eraser. I'll say them one more time. Then I'll say goodbye or adios. Okay, 13 in 1850, most Chinese immigrants arrived where? Please don't be funny, you guys, and say Chinatown. There was no Chinatown at that time, okay? All right, 14. Where did most of the women immigrants work? So I already went over that and we know what they did. All right. That's it. So thank you for the day. And the lesson is done. And I shall see you next week. Okay. Thank you.